We thank you, Lord. You are the most high God. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, Lord God, for your blessings on our life. Indeed, you are the most high God. As we go into your word, we ask for your blessing, Father. Minister to us. Bless us with spiritual knowledge. Increase our understanding. Let us fellowship with the word. Open our eyes up on the time to behold your word. Lord, we say thank you. We bless your name, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I will be seated. Amen. Amen. Let's appreciate Pastor and the choir. Let's appreciate them. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I have the privilege of bringing the word today, and I want to appreciate the pastor for this opportunity and ministers here. And I want to speak about something in my heart. And amazingly, it's the same thing we talked about in Sunday school when Pastor Ray talked about it too. Can we turn to Proverbs 14, 34? Proverbs 14, 34. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 34. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 34. It says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. I read it again. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. So the title of our message today is Righteousness Exalts. Praise the Lord. Righteousness Exalts. Righteousness Exalts. Righteousness Exalts. Righteousness Exalts. In my, I have this very funny thing about me academically. So when I was a student, I, did, I, I always try to think of a way to pass an exam with minimal, minimal work. How many people can identify with that? You know, you don't want to stress yourself, so you want to pass the exam. How many people were like that in school? Was it just me? It was just me. Oh, I ha, good. At least I have one sister. Minimum work. So, and that got me very far. Went to secondary school. Minimum, it didn't work, but, you know, just try, try to look a way to get by. Believe it or not, I went to medical school. We just, you know, you, the pass mark was not 100. Come on, now. if you get 65, you still pass. So, I got that far. Until I got to my final year. You know, the problem in final year was that you had to see a number of patients to be allowed to even write the exam. Obviously, unless you are going to lie that you saw the patients and you didn't actually see them, you have to physically go to the hospital and interact with the patients. Ah, now, how was I going to get past this? The topic is I still right. remember 1998. Now, the problem was that the actual main, what many people did was they would tell a lie that they saw patients that they didn't see. You know, you, in my part of the world, we call you guru-guru. You know, if you are British, you, call it, woo, 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 you know, so you tell a lie, you just go and pretend like you saw the patient. No, I didn't see the patient. So, but you had a workbook, you had to sign that. You, I think it was about 20 patients in my childhood, it was 1998. I thought about it. Said, How am I going to do this? Ha! Am I going to be going to the hospital in the night like every night? Like, it's hard work. Am I going to? I thought about lying briefly, but the problem with lying was that I was a cat carrying Pentecostal. So people will know that I didn't see the patients and I was lying that I saw them. I thought, 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 thought. I said, you know what? Let me just quietly go to this hospital. <laughs> so I went to the hospital. Again and again and again I went. But guess what? In the process, I became a good student. I became better at what I do. I began to, and because I was never going to tell a lie, and I knew I was not going to tell a lie, so because of that, I began to find myself working harder than I normally would. And I became a good student. And next thing, I went to a very good hospital to do my first, my you know, what we call foundation year. And at that time, I did not know that I would go abroad. Five years later, I think, I left the country. The problem with leaving the country is that the, end, the qualifying exam to become a doctor in this country, you are competing with everybody from the world, the Indians, the Pakistanis. If I hadn't done that then, I'm not sure I would have passed. So that decision to do the righteous thing is what accentuated, is what stabilized my career, is what blessed my career. And I have to say this. That is what has prompted the message that the righteousness exalts. If you take a decision that I only do what I know is right and just, over time, you will find out that it will benefit you in the long run. But if you try to do wuru wuru, it, a lie has speed, but it is truth that has endurance. Righteousness exalts. Now, what is righteousness? It's very simple. What is just? What is fair? We all know what is right. The basics of what is right. Don't cheat. Don't tell lies. Don't falsify figures. We know that. Everybody knows that. In fact, one, one uh, apo a Christian apologetic said that one of the proofs that God exists is that in man, there's like a, a homing device. We all know what is right and wrong. 
irrespective of where you are from or irrespective of your culture. He said, he gave an example. I said, a double agent, you know what a double agent is, a spy double agent. He's hated by both sides. Both people he's, he's falsifying for, and people actually employing. That, that's, we all know what is right. We all do. In, deep down in our hearts, we know what is right. Jesus said in Matthew 7 to what we call the golden rule, that whatever you want men to do to you, do the same to them. So if you do that, if, the second destination of righteousness, which, which we'll look at, which we'll look at is that whatever God has appointed for our obedience, that is what is righteous. Whatever is personal to what God has told you to do is what you know you should do. So, so for us Christians, you could raise the bar a bit more and say, you know what, God has told you do this, do it. God has told you don't do this, don't do that. So we talk about a moral code. That is what righteousness is. So righteousness is both personal and it is also in the community. Now, the one of the personal one we can relate to, isn't it? I've just told the story. The one we may not relate to so easily is the one in the community. And, and for those of us who went to school, Pastor, I talked about it. Why do we think African countries, developing countries, stay that way? I'll tell you the story. I listened to, I saw a video online from, it was, the person was actually Indian. He said he went, <laughs> he went to the friend of his to the Netherlands, right? And he wanted to buy milk. So they went there, the man tipped one liter of milk, put the money in and walked away. He looked with amazement and said, if it was in his country, most people would either take the milk and walk away <laughs> or, or even take the money as well or take more than what they, were, what they paid for. But he paid a righteous amount for what the man had said was milk, dropped the money and went away. You know the problem? In the countries where everybody does not obey that righteous principle, this is what we happen. The man we notice that people are taking are paying for milk, are taking milk they did not pay for. So he either dilute the milk to cover for costs, or we stop selling and have to employ an attendant. All that will increase the price of the milk. Now, if he dilutes the milk, you will then pay for a milk inspector. And then the milk inspector can become corrupt. It will be bribed by both the payers and the pay. All of that not adding value to the milk and making the community poorer. You see why developing countries remain developed, remain, remain developing. It doesn't work. Rules work because we respect them, not because you employ the police. Rules work because we respect them. Otherwise, you will oh, you stay there. That's it's why righteousness exalts over the long term. It's just the way it is. <laughs> I, I I've talked about that. You can keep seeing needless expenditure in the community. You will pay for more police, but get poorer outcomes. More police. Imagine, I, I went. I was telling people, I went um, back to my African home, you know, for a function last year. And the amount we spent on security alone was in you know, a big, big sum. That didn't add to the event. All we did was spend money. So that's why our communities remain that way. Without a culture of increase and establish, without a culture that promotes righteousness, societies do not develop. And by the way, that also works true in societies where you think that by making the rich poorer, the community will become richer. I don't know how that's supposed to work. We think that by overtaxing the rich or making sure they pay excessively, it's not, it just does not work. I remember a story I heard about a school teacher who was telling, a professor was telling his students that if you try to do that, that communist, like a communist attitude, it doesn't work. They said, ah, no, it works. Ah, everybody should take care of that. He said, okay, let's do a simple experiment. He said, um, let us call the grades I will give you the equivalent of you know, communal of money. So everybody prepare for the exam. I will mark everybody's script, but I will average all the scripts and give everybody the same grade. How does that sound? So in the first exam, some people worked hard, some people did not bother to work. Those who worked hard were meant to have gotten an A. Those who did not work meant to have gotten a D, but everybody got a B. What do you think happened in the next exam? Those who felt, ah, why am I working so hard if everybody's going to get the same grade? And they did not bother. And next thing, the grades dropped to a C and quarrels broke out. That's what happens. So it doesn't work either way. Now, there are two books that, uh, that if, you're in, if you're into books, these two books help. One of them is a book called the Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. Written by a guy called Max Weber, 1904. And one of the things he argued was that the fact that you, you have God on your side, it makes you want to you know, do good work because work is seen as your service to God. Second book, is uh, The Wealth and Poverty of Nations by a guy called David Landis. It's, I think it was 1995. 
David Lander is a professor of history at uh, history and economics at uh, Harvard. And he says the same thing, that we do not realize the impact of culture, 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 the asset that culture and enterprise does in, in, in adding to the wealth and value of societies. Now, let me say this very quickly. The duties of princes are to use their power to suppress vice and suppress and, uh, and support virtue. We talk about righteousness. Why does righteousness look like it does not work? Everybody knows here that righteousness was. Why does it look like there are two things, I think. One of these is this. I think let's turn to Ecclesiastes 8. Ecclesiastes 8, 11. Ecclesiastes 8, 11. Why do we have to remind ourselves that it is righteousness that exhausts? Ecclesiastes 8, 11. Ecclesiastes 8, 11 says, because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. So if you did something wrong and you got a slap from heaven, boom! Who learn to be righteous? But because it doesn't happen quickly, you know, you could get away with it short term. I'm not so sure. Temporary, temporary success. The United Nations calls it you, what you need to aim for is progressive, sustainable growth. Progressive, sustainable growth. But temporary success. You can falsify figures briefly and make a bit of change. But are you going to keep increasing the figures you falsify to make more money? No. So there's going to be problems. And there's one that youths often, often worry about. You know, how, you know, when you have teenage sons, you have to be very careful. I have a teenage son who looks you know, quite chunky. The kind of one that if I, were, if I was a gang leader, I would have recruited him. And he tells me about how people come to offer him drugs to sell or to take. True story. But I don't live in a city. I live not far from here. I live you know, a reasonably good area. But because why do they do that? Because the temporary gain. What's the problem with selling drugs? Well, you have to sell more drugs to make more money. And in the process, you will clash with the neighboring drug lord. That's what causes the drug wars, and that's what leads to many of the stabbings you hear about, because it's temporary gain. However, try telling the same young person that, you know what, study very hard in school, and finish your A-levels, three years your first degree, a few postgraduates, 10 years down the line, you can earn a six-figure income. Ah, 10 years away, ah! That's the reason. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily speedily so let, let's remember that that's the first the second reason why one of the second reason why sometimes it looks like righteousness does not work is function versus glamour that is to say that pastor i talked about this two weeks ago satan's scheme on the earth is to make it look as if it is something that is evil that is glamorous that's how satan satan has wired the earth such that if we are not careful we will see the evil things getting away with it. Evil people getting away with it. And we think that that's the right thing to do. I mean, of us here watch films. Be honest. Any film. I know we're in church, so you don't lie and add that to it. <laughs> now, how does Hollywood wire the films? What is the usual storyline? Most of the storylines are either fantasy or something evil going on for a long time, either unpunished or eventually punished, but there's a long period in which the person gets away with it. That's what makes the storyline interesting. So in Hollywood, most films, you will see somebody, you know, designing a clever theft that nobody has ever been able to steal from there before, but the man successfully steals it and gets away with it. That is interesting. In the process, you know what happens? We get used to the fact that it's possible to woo woo to do some woo woo and get away with it. No, it's not true. So it's, it's one of the schemes of Satan. Let's be very careful. It's a bit like the get-rich schemes. Why do people still fall for get-rich schemes? Because we assume that, in my, my case, is different. I will quickly get rich before the thing collapses and get away with it. No. It is righteousness that exalts. It is righteousness that exalts. Righteousness that exalts. In my, I was in boarding school. I think I was in my, that would have been my year, year, year 10 or year 11, one or the other. Somebody came to my boarding school, this is back in Africa, with a get rich scheme. And he, the idea was that you sell some things, you, they bump up your name, and you make some money. 
And I fell for it and lost money heavily. And I thought, when I thought about it, why did I do that? Why did I do that? But you know what? The beauty of it was at least I learned my lesson. And after that, I never bothered again. So years later, by the time I got to university and we were giving boss three, and somebody came to now get rich scheme, I said, oh, I've been there before. Let, let's have that same attitude to righteousness. That look, I know people might make money short term, but long term, this does not work. It is righteousness that exalts. Now, very quickly, let's see some things that righteousness is supposed to do for us. Ephesians chapter 6, 1 to 8, and I round off with that. Ephesians chapter 6. And verse 1 to 8. Ephesians 6, 1 to 8. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 1 to 8. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Now, what should, what should righteousness do for us? I read from verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And you, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Bond servers, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling, in sincerity of heart as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servers of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Verse 8, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he's a slave or free. A <clears throat> couple of things I'll bring out from this scripture about righteousness. The first one is, verse 1, it says, children... Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. That we are righteous does not exempt us, or more like it is the reason why we should show honor. Honor. Honor for time honored principles. Honor to respect advice when elders are speaking. Honor to say that if God said it, that is what I'll do. Honor. 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 For the young people here, you know, I get very worried when I talk to people. Christian youths, and when they speak, they say, uncle, that's your generation. Like, really? Really? I'm not an uncle. And everything, I, all the experience I've had, I'm not woke. All that is gone. Really? Really? No. The time, to, I say, gravity has not changed. Two plus two is still four. The principles of God do not change. Technology does, so we think they do. They don't change, brethren. God's principles do not change. Because there's iPhone 10 and then there's iPhone 12 and then there's iPhone. No, 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 no. God's principles do not change. Honor. If you do not honor, you know, they said when you are so proud, you're like somebody wearing an oversized cap. It covers your eyes and you cannot see what is ahead. Let's be very careful. Honor. Honor for what God says. Now, second thing, this is now the, the second part. Now, look at what it says to fathers. It's, and you fathers do not, pro verse 4, and you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admission of the Lord. Now, the second thing there is that respect is still what you owe everyone, whether you are old or young. Respect. Those of us who are older, righteousness means we'll use our power, our position, and our age to defer to young people, to bring them up in the, in the admonition of the Lord. No one is too big. Because if God can speak to a prophet through a donkey, then he can speak to anybody through anybody. Respect. We still owe people respect. That's part of righteousness. That's what righteousness behoves us to do that. Now, the, 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 the last one is very, is very subtle. Uh, look at verse 5. Bond servers, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in sincerity of heart, as to the Lord. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with goodwill doing service as to the Lord and not to men. How many of us believe in hard work? Empty your hand up. Hard work. It's not a popular scripture. Hard work. Hard work. Personal development. Hard work. That your righteous does not exempt you from that. Hard work. Hard work. Hard work. I work in healthcare. And so in healthcare, one of the common things that happen is people calling sick because they don't want to work. But also in that same office, there are people who almost double their income by doing extra shifts. Question, do you think the people who call in sick will go and meet the boss and say, see, now we're on the same grade. How come my salary is twice mine? <laughs> you see how funny that sounds? Because you know that the reason why it's twice yours is the person did twice as much work. I don't do it with eye service. Do it because it's the right thing to do. Do it because you know that you're doing it unto the Lord. Hard work, brethren. 
We are righteous means we should be hard working. It means we should turn up on time. It means people should rely on us. It means that people can rely on us for good quality work. Then God can bless us. Hard work, hard work, hard work, hard work. Do it because it's what, it's what righteous people do. Let your work be part of your identity. I'm a Christian, so I won't come late. Can they, can they have a meeting in, in, in my place of work? I mean, I'm talking about people who come late and my name is there. Christian? Really? Really? Hard work. I told my children, I said, look, because I know I'm not going to cheat in the exam hall, that means I'm going to study before I get there. So that I'm not going to spend two hours <laughs> meditating on the Bible instead of doing my, <laughs> we used to say my, when I was going to chewing my pen for want or something to do. No, hard work. Hard work. Because I know I don't want to beg, so I will do the extra shifts if I need to. Hard work. Hard work. Because I know I want to live a decent quality of life, I will develop myself. Hard work. Is part, that's part of the righteous ethic. Hard work. Jacob said, look, I worked so hard that I was the one looking after the cattle by day and by night by, of the sheep. Day and night. Hard work, brethren. It's part of righteousness. Hard work. Hard work. Hard work. And God says, the, 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 the final verse there is that, verse 8. God is just knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he's a slave or free. Remember, when this scripture has been written, slavery existed. And Paul is trying to say, God is not mocked. Remember, Galatians 6, it was written to Christians. God is not that. God is watching with his reward. He's watching. He's watching. That whatever good a man does, he will receive. The problem many times is that we are, God did not say we'll reap where we sow. He said we'll reap when we sow. God will make sure you'll be rewarded. Oh, that I can testify. God will make sure you'll be rewarded. Even if man cheats you, God will make sure that you will not be cheated in the long term. I'll tell you a joke. When I was doing, I was doing, I, was, I used to be a junior doctor in pediatrics in this country, 2008. I was doing extra shifts to make extra money. They were in pain. So one day, the people stopped doing the shifts. And then they did a meeting, blah, blah, blah. They found out what was going on. And then I still remember one of the consultants there who was, you know, saw me one of the shifts. I said, oh, you're working very hard. Then when I saw the money, I got less than what I was paid. Guess what had happened? The, the man saw the extra shift paper. To be very honest, because I was trying to be so honest, I wrote how many hours done? I wrote 7.5. The man wrote, round up to the nearest whole number, seven. He said, you should pay only seven hours. How does that work in mathematics? I know, I know. I still remember because it hurt. I needed the money then. You think I look back with regret? No, I don't. I look back and I thank God that that taught me to move my life forward. Oh, yes. You will get such characters. Jacob got them. The Israelites got them. But God that you serve will make sure. Because that experience taught me it was time to leave pediatrics. And today I'm happy where I am. Hard work, brethren. Hard work. God is watching. God said, it's, Paul, Paul is, the Bible is reassuring us that, that look, don't be, God is not mocked, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same of the Lord. As we say in my part of the world, because of God, he will receive. No, God, God, payday will come. Payday always comes. You know, you know the problem we have with shortcuts? The problem we have with shortcuts is that, you know, when you, how many of us have tried to pack a car before? When you're packing, you take one turn, you say, oh, you take another turn. Oh, let me just, boom, the car just crashes and you scratch your car. Oh, my car has many stripes like that. I've had cars with that. That's the problem many times. We want to take a shortcut. You pick, no, righteousness exalts. Righteousness exalts. So let's remember this. Whenever we're tempted to take shortcuts, to do Ruguru, that is righteousness that exalts. Three things we must do for righteousness quickly. First thing is embrace it. Let's embrace that righteousness is what we should do. The Bible says in Micah 6, 8. He has shown the old man what is good. That you should love, you know, do justly, love mercy, walk humbly. Embrace it. Announce it. Let people know that righteousness is what you do. Let people know that. Righteousness, that I'm a righteous man. I don't engage in all that shortcuts. It is true that there are people from my part of the world that can be, you know, a particular, behave in a particular way. I'm not like that. I'm not like that. I'm a righteous man. The third one, propagate it. Let people know. Let your children know that this is how we do things. Why must that be the story? Why must that be the story that you know, people look at, look at you, look at my family, and they, they can't tell that these are righteous people, that people upright, that people who serve God, that people who uphold God's standards. Let's do those. Let's embrace it. Let's announce it. Let's propagate it. Let's let people know that we believe in righteousness. And brethren, it may not be fancy. It may not look so in the short term, but payday always comes. And I want to be around for that payday. I mean, we all be around in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's bow our heads to pray.
Let's bow our heads to pray and thank God for what we've heard. That righteousness exalts. Righteousness exalts a nation. Righteousness exalts a people. Let's ask that God will teach us to put this long term in our view. We we'll always remember it is righteousness. Whenever we are tempted to, to go astray, to do something, to take a shortcut, to do something that we know deep down in our hearts is not God's best, that we will not, be, we will not do it. We would instead take a long view. We will put in the work. We would embrace righteousness. We would announce it that God's counsel may be clear in our lives, that God's people will look at us and know that we are upholding, we are operating by God's standards, that that would be what we will always do. People will look at us and say, these ones, these ones are people who love God. They are not just in for the short term. They are not just in, you know, for you know, five minutes Christians. No, but these are people who embrace God's righteousness. They are people who announce God's righteousness, people who propagate it, who raise our children to understand the principles of righteousness. And that will be our portion. That in long term, as people look at us, 10 years down the line, 15 years down the line, we'll be like the man that Jesus said, you know, that dug deep and built his house and the house stood the test of time. Thank you, Father, because you do this for us in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.